Good evening and welcome to Intellectual Publics. My name is Ken Wissaker and I am the director of the program coming to you from the Graduate Center at CUNY. Um, before we begin, I want to thank Chelsea Largent and Stephanie Gayette uh, for their work in organizing the program. And uh, tonight, I think this is going to be really extremely special. Uh, we're here to talk about Emily Boone's new book, A Nimble Arc, James van der Zee and Photography, which is uh, just out in the Duke University Press series edited by Kelly Jones and Stephen Nelson. Uh, and it's one of those books I love because it's both about something important and van der Zee is unquestionably a major American photographer, really important in and of himself and his work. Uh, but it also teaches us how to think more broadly. Um, van der Zee's photo photographs of the Harlem Renaissance are the, among the most iconic American photographs. His late life portrait of Basquiat is one of the most famous portraits of the artist more than a half century later. He was the one Harlem artist uh, prominently featured at the now famously problematic Harlem on My Mind show at the Metropolitan Museum in 1969. But Boone's book tells us this, the art is only half the story, if that. Van der Zee's studio at 135th and Lenox, now Malcolm X Boulevard, was central to everyday Harlem life. All those pictures of babies for the crisis covers or newlyweds or graduates, the studio needs to stay in business in lean times and good ones. What happens if we see the art in the context it had in the community as fully situated rather than starting with the art as if it only existed free floating, hey, great photo, or in a narrative about the history of the medium or of the place. And um, Emily's book, it goes into that in such great depth, it's really fantastic. So I'm really pleased to have her here tonight and also Dawood Bay, who so many times I've seen posing on Facebook in front of the Van der Zee studio location. Um, he famously was influenced as a teenager by going to see the show at the Metropolitan, and it's an honor to have him joining us tonight. Um, many of you probably know the Van der Zee archive has moved to the Metropolitan Museum uh, in a kind of ironic return. Uh, <laughs> And so there's clearly going to be much more to think about with his work and see his work uh, in the time to come. Uh, we're going to uh, talk until about 20 of eight or 20 of uh, seven central, as they used to say in network time. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. The chat is open, so you feel free to use that. But for questions that you want answered, please put them in the Q&A. Um, Emily Boone is assistant professor of African-American and African diaspora arts in the Department of Art History at NYU. Boone researches and teaches the art and visual culture of the African diaspora with a focus on photography. Uh, this book that's just out, A Nimble Art, James Van Der Zee and Photography, is her first book. She's also published on 19th century to contemporary art and visual culture in journals, including American Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art Journal, African Art, the History of Photography, and also work on the history of Haitian photography and Canadian art history. Prior to her appointment at NYU, uh, Boone was our colleague serving as an assistant professor at New York City College of Technology, part of CUNY, and as a faculty member in the art history program at CUNY Graduate Center. In addition, she had postdocs at Williams College and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dawood Bay, uh, this is the brief version, sorry. Uh, for almost five decades, MacArthur Fellow Dawood Bay has been a groundbreaking American artist, making evocative work about those subjects and communities that are often marginalized and mining the histories of those Black communities and its people. He began his career in 
1975 with a series of photographs, Harlem, USA, that were later exhibited in his first one-person exhibition at the Studio Museum of Harlem in 1979. His work has since been the subject of numerous exhibitions and retrospectives at museums and galleries worldwide, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Barbican Center, Birmingham Museum of Art, Detroit Institute of Art, High Museum of Art, San Francisco Museum of Art, Seattle Art Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, of course, and recently, I'm sure many of you saw the fabulous retrospective at the Whitney Museum of, of American Art here in New York. His most recent retrospective exhibition, Dawood Bay and American Project, organized by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and the Whitney, opened at those institutions and traveled to the High Museum uh, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. His work has been the subject of several monographs, including the highly recommended, if you can still find one, uh, Seeing Deeply from University of Texas Press in 2017, and the more recent uh, Street Portraits from MACK Mac Books from 2021. His critical writings on contemporary art and photography have appeared in many publications. Um, the exhibition and publication Elegy brings together the history projects and landscape-based work that Bay has made since 2012. And that publication forthcoming, right? I believe, accompanies an exhibition that will be at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. In addition to the MacArthur Fellowship, Bay has been recognized with a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, a fellowship from the National Endowment of the Arts, the Hirshhorn Artist Award, the ICP Infinity Award, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from Howard University, among others. Dode Bay has an MFA degree from Yale University School of Art and is currently professor of art and a former distinguished college artist at Columbia College, Chicago, where he has taught since 1998. And with that, I want to turn the conversation over to Dawood and Emily, and uh, I'm going to go off screen and really excited about uh, hearing you talk about uh, James Van Der Zee and photography tonight. Dawood, all yours. Okay. Okay. Well, Ken, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here tonight. Dawood, thank you so much for being in, in conversation uh, with me. Um, I know we um, touched base a little bit before this and reminisced about you know us being on uh, a panel years ago. So it's so good to return here um, and to uh, start this conversation um, about, uh, about Van Der Zee. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. You know, Van Disease work is clearly something that I have thought quite a bit about since uh, seeing the Harlem on My Mind exhibition when I was 16 years old in 1969. So um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where should we start? Um, let's start uh, with Harlem on my mind. Uh, within um, my book, A Nimble Arc, um, I talk about um, Harlem on my mind in the, uh, the final chapter, uh, chapter four. Um, and I actually start with um, the, um, that engagement that you had with the show when you were 16. Um, and also uh, that, that first visit um, that the well-known photo historian um, an artist, uh, Deborah Willis, had uh, visiting the show when she was uh, 21. Um, I really wanted to highlight um, these, um, you know, uh, first exposures um, for uh, uh, young adults um, to see uh, these uh, works of the Black community um, on a large scale and then also on the walls um, of the Met. Uh, so I, I'd love to hear uh, you kind of recount uh, that experience. Well, I was uh, 16 years old when I went to see the exhibition. And uh, 
I had never been to a museum exhibition on my own before. So this was the first time venturing from uh, Queens, New York, where I grew up, uh, to a museum. And I actually didn't go to see uh, the exhibition. I, what I actually was going to see were the people who were demonstrating in front of the Met in response to the exhibition. Uh, the Art Workers Coalition, Black Emergency Cultural Coalition uh, were demonstrating in front of the Met around a number of issues, which could probably be condensed around the issue of authorship, who was being allowed to author the experience of this African-American community in a mainstream museum, along with other issues which we probably won't have time to go into this evening uh, around the very nature of the exhibition itself, uh, the content of the exhibition and what that content, content should be in relation to uh, a faithful representation of the Harlem community and its peoples and culture in 1969. And so I, I went. I eventually found my way to the Met by walking through Central Park. And when I got there, there were no demonstrations that day. And uh, it's ironic because if there had been, I'm not sure that I would have gone in to see the museum. So I like to think of it as fate conspiring that the demonstrators not be there that day, so mm -hmm. that I could go in to see the museum. And uh, it was, once I found the museum, it was, uh, as I've often described it, uh, an extraordinarily transformative experience. Uh, largely the experience, as I'd never seen it before, of uh, photographs of African Americans on the wall of a museum like the Met, where I, I would have expected to see Rembrandt, Van Gogh, and other European masters. Uh, but these were photographs of people who looked like the people that I knew from my own family. Uh, my mother and father had actually lived in Harlem, uh, only leaving Harlem uh, when I was born. So the experience of seeing these photographs on the wall at a museum and seeing people walking around contemplating and looking at the photograph was the first uh, engagement that I had with how photographs might function in the world uh, off the pages of books and magazines, which was uh, until that point how I thought about uh, what photographs were. I had gotten uh, my first serious camera the year before uh, from my godmother uh, who had passed the camera on to me from my godfather. So I, I had begun to think about photographs, but not photographs, certainly uh, in a museum. Mm -hmm. So that exhibition uh, pretty much uh, in terms of both what the museum might be and equally as important, the kinds of engagements that one might have with the museum. The fact that the museum was not a benign space and that the institution could be spoken back to as all institutions of power were being spoken back to in that volatile moment of 1968, 1969 moment of social transformation and revolution uh, in America. And the photographs that I remembered the most, uh, which were given the most uh, prominent display uh, 
by a single photographer were the photographs of James Van Der Zee. And at that time, I had no, no sense of the hierarchy of, or genres uh, through which photographs might be framed. I had no idea about the difference between uh, art photographs or photographs of the kind that were being shown uh, in that exhibition. Uh, I just knew that these were black people in photographs and that they were in a museum. And mm -hmm. Van der Zee's photographs stayed with me uh, because of uh, the formal quality of them as much as for the content, mm -hmm. which, was, which became increasingly evident and important to me as the years ran on, as I questioned what was it that I found so compelling about some of those photographs. And it was both of those things. It was clearly the content, but it was also the quality of uh, the picture maker. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. with uh, that exhibition and largely the memory of uh, some of Van der Zee's photographs along with my own family history, those are the two experiences that became the foundation for my own project that I began in 1975. And then, of course, over the years, as I began to think about both the photographs themselves and the uh, experience of having been there and began to think about both of them in a more critical context, and a Van der Zee's photograph began to take on a life very different from the way those large, what can only be described as blow-ups. They were not, they were not fine photographic prints mm -hmm. uh, as we would describe them now. They were four by eight feet, eight by 12 feet. One of them was probably eight by 20 feet, uh, group portraits. So this idea uh, about the ways in which photographs can be made and engaged and how the context for photographs can begin to shift and change the way that Van der Zee's photographs migrated from that exhibition into the context in which if people did not see them, uh, in the Harlem on My Mind exhibition, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. probably then began to encounter them in a more fine art, fine photography context. So mm -hmm. the work began to shift away from the larger social context that the Harlem on My Mind uh, mm -hmm. pretty much framed the work because his photographs were one of several works spanning decades in the visualization of the Harlem community. And now the work became its own individualized, standalone, reproduced in fine mm -hmm. photographic books like the monograph from mm -hmm. uh, Morgan and Morgan mm -hmm. that was produced mm -hmm. in 1973. Yes. But Morgan, Morgan was publishing Ansel Adams. They were publishing fine art photographers. And now we found Van der Zee in that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. want to go too deeply into that because you, you talk about it. But yes, I, that was I, my I, initial experience with uh, Van der Zee's work. Thank you. Thank you. That was really helpful to uh, hear about your early experience and then also um, sort of how uh, the reception of, of Van Der Zee's photograph really uh, evolved um, and into um, a, a fine art reading. Um, but I do want to go back to that, that early moment um, when you um, engaged the work of Van Der Zee at the Harlem on My Mind show, um, because that was the moment for me where it really kind of piqued my interest in um, maybe, you know, thinking uh, about the show in, in different ways um, and in ways that um, 
you know, are definitely very respectful and um, at the same time, uh, very respectful and aligned uh, with scholarship that looked at the activism um, that took place in response uh, to the show. Um, as we all know, the show was highly uh, problematic, um, had a number of um, issues and uh, raised some pretty major concerns um, for Black artists and activists um, in Harlem. Um, and, you know, we can, I feel like there have been books uh, written it, on, it, on it, that it topic. The and the publication too. That's right. And the highly, publication Yeah, too. which was highly yeah. controversial for yes. me. Very, uh, yep, very controversial. Um, and there have been excellent books written um, on on that topic. Um, but for me, it was really your early recollection um, of seeing the photographs and describing them as extraordinary. Um, and Deb Willis, um, again, the photo historian who also went uh, to the Harlem on My Mind show when she was, I think she was about 21 at the time um, and used uh, uh, similar terms um, to describe sort of her uh, sense of awe and interest in seeing Van Der Zee's photographs. Um, and my, my reading of the photographs and of the show was also informed by my own experience um, seeing the panels. Um, as I, um, I'd uh, like to share that I, uh, as part of my research, um, I flew down to South Carolina um, State University um, and HBCU um, who, who has had the original uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art Harlem on my mind panels um, in their collection. Um, which I would, love, they, which I would which, love to see. It, they are still down there. Um, sometimes they put them on display, um, but most often they are in storage. And I spent um, a couple of days down there having the, the archivist and the museum staff take them out for me. Um, multiple people were needed to move them because as you imagine, uh, these panels are, are gigantic. Um, so what they did is they 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 took them out from storage. They chose a uh, you know an absolutely gigantic space to put them to kind of um, display them on. And I just was able to stand and spend time uh, with the panels. Um, and as I was spending time with the panels, um, all of the the criticism um, about the Met show uh, was still very still very kind of fresh in, in my mind. Um, but at the same time, I was filled with this experience of, wow, this is an amazing experience um, to stand in front of a, a life-size um, Van Der Zee uh, portrait, um, whether it be he has this uh, fantastic portrait of maybe 20 or 30 individuals, and they are all very carefully posed um, in front of a, a stoop. It looks like either um, some sort of like familial celebration. Um, he also has had these fantastic uh, photographs of women standing um, in front of a um, like a um, like a lunch serving um, institution. Um, he also had a, a range of um, panels of, of children um, in Harlem standing in front of uh, their school. Um, it was in that moment that I was almost, you know, um, as as possible as this could be, uh, transported back to the, the 20s and, and 30s um, with the, the poses, the looks, the, the appearances, the building facades that I was able to engage with um, on, a, on a full scale. Um, so at that moment, I wanted to sort of bring that sense of, of awe and that sense of um, interest and the, the real like aesthetic experience of, of seeing Van Der Zee's uh, photographs like that. Um, very different from, you know, peering into the books that had been published on Van Der Zee and experience in his photographs. Um, and I wanted to, I want to think through that and I wanted to build um, off of that. And in, in the chapter, I um, really go into um, what it meant uh, for uh, potentially potential viewers um, like yourself at, at 16 or like Deb at 21, to walk into a museum, um, individuals that might not have been, you know, within the art world, uh, they didn't have, they weren't artists, um, they weren't training to be art historians, um, they were there to, to see uh, the work, um, and with, um, you know, potentially limited 
uh, you know, the, the terms of, of uh, what it means to engage work within an art historical context. And I, I wanted to offer those, those viewers, uh, the potential viewers, the, the possibility um, to actually in, enjoy and, and see the value of Van Der Zee's photographs as photographs, um, even though they were in this context, which was extremely problematic and could have been so um, better um, uh, planned um, at the end of the day. Um, one of the reasons I think it's really important when thinking about Harlem on my mind um, is that one of the reasons that people um, could engage with Van Der Zee's photograph to the level that they did, uh, the fact that they're um, you know completely um, blown up, um, but still um, extremely detailed. You know, you can see the um, the creases in in one's eye. You can see the folds in in a shirt um, as though the person is standing in front of you, um, and and that is thanks to not only Van Der Zee's skill behind uh, the camera. Um, um, but also the the strength of the the archive, um, the fact that uh, Van der Zee, um, you know, in 1969 still had a a full, um, and this would have been 68 when Wedgwell McGee went and and looked uh, for uh, potential material in Harlem. Um, Van der Zee had a a full robust. Um, uh, archive in his back room, um, and many of them were eight by ten. Um, eight by 10 glass negatives, um, the kind of, uh, you know, photographic format that would have allowed um, the, the printing uh, of, exactly. of those yeah. very, very you can, large. You can make prints that size from an eight by 10 glass plate negative and mm -hmm. it would hold up. That's uh, right. Have been made in the manner of a photojournalist working with a 35 millimeter mm -hmm. uh, camera, they would have fallen apart. Mm -hmm. And as I sit here listening to you and think about this, the fact that he was working with uh, mostly, certainly in the studio, eight by 10, on mm -hmm. location, eight by 10, four by five, which is still large format, that, that is probably the reason his photographs were presented that size in that exhibition because yeah. there could be and yeah. to maintain the quality because there were a lot of smaller eight by 10 photographs and right. they right. received that treatment probably because they could without mm -hmm. all the material information of the photograph uh, being lost. Mm -hmm. And the fact mm -hmm. of uh, him working with those large format cameras, uh, as I came to know from spending years working with a four by five camera, it's mm -hmm. also what gives them the, give the subject and give the photograph that wonderful appearance of formality mm -hmm. because everything has to be staged and posed in mm -hmm. front of the camera. Nothing is done on the fly. So there is a good amount of time being taken taking place in the making of the photograph mm -hmm. a very real degree of formal positioning mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of that is what gives those pictures their wonderful quality mm -hmm. uh, of formality mm -hmm. and uh even you know particularly we kind of expect that in the studio Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily expect that kind of formality in the informal environment of the street. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that make his portraits of uh, Adam Clayton Powers' congregation, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Rabbi Matthews and his congregation, the uh, football players sitting on the steps. They all have a wonderful sense of time slowed down mm -hmm. and given this elegant sense of uh, form and through the concentration of the subject in that kind of situation, the thing that I came to identify in those kinds of photographs is this wonderful quality of what I call interiority. Mm. And seeing black people possessed of this quality of interiority is not something that we always see. 
And mm. I think that is what also makes those, you know, formal portraits, in particular, made with a large format camera, and mm -hmm. with the degree of attention that mm -hmm. is called for, both on the part of the photographer and the subject, mm -hmm. is something uh, more deeply engaging than made with a small camera in just a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. That was something that I took away from the exhibition mm -hmm. that at 16, I didn't quite know why they look that way. Mm -hmm. I, I know why they look that way now. Now, yes, yes, uh, and we can. It, it, yeah. it attracted me before I even knew exactly how and why. Yes. yes. Also, it's also uh -huh. the reason that those photographs, when they did migrate into a fine art context or a monographic context, they mm -hmm. still hold up. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. Definitely. It's interesting. Yeah. Not every picture holds yeah. up a small, you know, small size on the page. It might be five by seven or in an exhibition mm -hmm. where it might be five by seven feet as opposed right. to inches. So right. I began to really understand uh, what my uh, initial uh, intuitive attraction to the work was. Mm -hmm. that I continued mm -hmm. to work and began making photographs in the streets with a large format camera. Mm -hmm. I began to understand mm -hmm. them that much more deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my intention in this self-initiated project mm -hmm. was very different from Van der Zee being called and commissioned to make a portrait. But mm -hmm. self-initiated mm -hmm. or commissioned, you still have to figure out the same thing when you show up. That's right. Thing. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't but, matter how or why you got there. Once you're there, you have to figure that out. But I think one of the things that I, you know, also thought about as I continued my own work, uh, certainly uh, starting out in Harlem and then returning to the streets with a large format camera mm -hmm. to do work that was entirely self-initiated as opposed to commission. And people would tell me, oh, you're doing what Van de Zee did when he was documenting the Harlem Renaissance. And I said, no, Van de Zee was not documenting the Harlem Renaissance, although the photograph in retrospect can mm -hmm. be seen as having documented an aspect of the Black community at the moment of the Harlem Renaissance. And I think that's one of the ongoing tensions around mm -hmm. Van de Zee's work that your book, which I think is a deeply meaningful piece of scholarship, finally resolved people's mm -hmm. confusion about reading the work through the lens of the present, rather than being able to read the work for what it meant at the time it was made. Mm -hmm. It's both of those things. It is, it That's is. That's that nimble arc, as you yes. call it. I love yes. the title. Oh, That's thank that you. That nimble arc that you navigate. Thank you, you. thank that, you. That both of those things simultaneously, mm -hmm. but we can't fully understand the work unless we understand the context. And for me, we talked about this earlier, the context is as much these Black subjects, these Black people in Harlem going to Van de Zee to be photographed. Right, right. I can talk yeah. a little bit more about um, um, that experience. Deciding that, this, yeah, deciding that yeah. they want to author. Yes, that's an right. Of themselves that mm -hmm. doesn't exist in the wider social culture. Mm -hmm. And now they need mm -hmm. someone to enact this. Yes, and having the, the choice and the opportunity to choose a uh, photographer to, to, to do okay. so. Um, during that, that time of, and we can, and we talked about the 1969 context, and we can 
uh, jump back and uh, talk about the early 20th century, um, the 20s and 30s, where uh, Van Der Zee had a very, very active uh, client base in Harlem. Uh, and these were individuals who some of some of whom lived um, and worked in Harlem. Others were coming um, from afar um, to visit Van Der Zee's uh, uh, studio. Uh, but it is, it's important to remember that this was a storefront studio. Um, he actually had four um, consecutively run. Uh, they were always on the, the first floor um, of the buildings, um, which enabled people uh, to, you know, walk down the busy uh, avenues of, of Harlem, um, look into his window displays, um, you know, get an understanding of the type of work that he did and make the decision uh, whether to go inside or to uh, continue on. Um, another important thing uh, to remember is that when people continued on, they'd very likely run into another studio. Um, I know that there is um, this longstanding myth that uh, Van Der Zee was uh, the greatest and the, the only one um, in Harlem. Uh, the way scholarship um, sometimes frame him is, is being the, the, the preeminent and, you know, almost the only one at the same time. Um, and that definitely was not the case. There was a very active world of um, uh, various photography studios um, lining number, uh, the major uh, avenues yeah, of, of Harlem. Harlem and across it's the country. True. It is you know, exactly I, across the country. Yeah. Yeah. Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. All over. Yeah. All over. Photographer yeah. Has come to be isolated as. That's and I right. Think that, that's important to remember also. But mm -hmm. I, I'm really fascinated by mm -hmm. and interested in this idea that the photographs exist because the Black subjects, the Black person took mm -hmm. some stuff. They mm -hmm. decided, I'm going to author this picture with Mr. Van Der Zee, mm -hmm. an mm -hmm. image of myself that I don't even see in the world, but I know is me. That's right. It is not that Van Der Zee went out and found these subjects. No. It, this was not no. his artistic sort of in, intentions to find them, um, but they showed up at his studio. Um, it's also important to remember that Van Der Zee really limited his um, his his sittings uh, to about four or five a day. Um, so in comparison to other studios that would sort of have people, um, you know, just kind of coming through all day, uh, Van Der Zee really took his time. Um, that that pose that Dawood is is talking about was really important for him to making sure making sure that the individuals um, were standing uh, just so um, that their uh, clothing was settled in such a way that their face um, you know, was turned uh, the right direction. Um, also, Van Der Zee had such a, a, a fantastic um, uh, skill um, when it came to not only his 8x10 camera, um, but also um, dealing with lighting issues. Um, he, um, even when um, the um, um, electric light bulb was, uh, you know, introduced and became popular within photography studio spaces. Um, Van Der Zee was still using his uh, his flash uh, uh, lighting. He was um, a real kind of stickler to uh, sticking to uh, the um, the equipment uh, that he knew and um, and loved. Um, he was using that eight by ten camera you know, uh, longer than uh, many of his peers, um, because that's what, not only what he knew, but those were his tools um, that were giving him that, that beautiful, um, the, the tonal range that he wanted to, exactly. to capture. Exactly. Um, just this, this absolute, um, you know, um, craft of, of making photographs and uh, that he, he knew it so well. Um, Anthony Barboza, um, tells this great story. Anthony Parboza was his uh, was Van Der Zee's um, assistant when Van Der Zee returned to photography um, decades, decades later. We're talking in the 70s, 80s um, with the Basquiat portrait. Um, and uh, uh, Barboza tells the story that when, you know, Van Der Zee was taking his photographs, even though he was in failing health, he needed to sit, he wasn't able to stand. Um, Barboza actually had to, you know, do a lot of um, uh, 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 taking the photographs. Um, it was it was Van Der Zee um, that 
uh, knew the, um, the, the length of the aperture uh, when the lens needed to open and close. He was um, that uh, skilled and had, I mean, it was almost like his, his mind was working as a, as a camera, as a machine. He had the lighting uh, meters um, down uh, through his experience, through his sense of, of sight and really didn't need sort of all the equipment. Um, now you get to that level of mastery through decades and decades of experience and that is experience um that is that is really um coming almost at the height um, of his talent in the the 20s and 30s when he's having these four to five um you know sittings with subjects uh, per day um, and producing um, his most well-known uh, uh photographs these photographs of people who are um, driving his his business and his his practice, um, who are coming in and who are asking him um, for how how they want to be uh, represented. They are uh, choosing him um, amongst uh, a whole number of photographers they could have chosen down yeah. the street, around the corner, uh, in downtown, uh, you know, farther down in Manhattan and in, in Brooklyn, uh, these different locuses of uh, the world of photography. Um, but these sitters, these individuals are really going to, to Van Der Zee and saying, I want this photographer uh, to take my photo. Which of course is why he kept the, uh, his work in the window. That was a display of his craft. Yes, it was. And the, the other thing that's inter interesting about this whole uh portrait sitting project is that the photographs were made as i call them as a kind of self-affirming private display mm -hmm. only for mm -hmm. public consumption as they ended up in books none of those people ever intended that those photographs they were kind of self-affirming mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm photographs that they kept on their mantle, on mm -hmm. their uh, table, mm -hmm. in order to see reflected back to them mm -hmm. the self that they knew they were that mm -hmm. would appear mm -hmm. out in the larger world. So yes. it was a very great. intentional act on the part of the subject. And uh, Van de Zee was the, I guess you could say, collaborator. The one he that can realize this yeah. big, good, you know, and you, if you want yeah. to do this, like you've saved your money, now mm -hmm. we're going to go to do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you described it, his, you know, the level of knowledge and the practice of his craft, the technical aspect. If you use a different lighting, it's going to look harsh. So he mm -hmm. didn't do that. You mm -hmm. know, the mm -hmm. direct flash, which flash bulbs have become popular, it wouldn't have that wonderful tonality. And, you know, so he was practicing a craft, practicing mm -hmm. a craft. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a craft that was enacted first by someone decided, deciding that they want to make this photograph of themselves. They want to see themselves as That's they want right. themselves to be without having to, the only other way to do that is to stand there looking in, in the mirror at yourself. But right. if you are a right. lasting, enduring image to mm -hmm. affirm your presence and mm -hmm. to share that with your family, your loved ones, maybe your friends, That's you right. need a photograph. Right. And, and I think that would be. Yeah. yeah, that's who he was. And a community that's... of people who mm -hmm. were affirming their presences mm -hmm. through James Van Der mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think it's an interesting way to look at the uh, at the project, as opposed to people mistakenly thinking, as you described, that he was doing the project. No, people were doing their own project with him. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And part of the project, you know, we've just spent so much time talking about the arrival at the studio, the actual photograph being taken, a whole uh, different story can be told about what happens after um, you know, the client leaves the studio with the photograph. Where does that photograph go? Is it then displayed on a mantle place? Is it put by a bedside? Um, one of the um, avenues that I was very, very interested 
in um, exploring in my book um, is um, how the photographs are then traveling and oftentimes leaving um, New York City, um, how in many cases we know um, that those photographs are going to down, they're going down south um, mm -hmm. to be with uh, their rel relatives. They're actually going to the Caribbean. Um, they're really traveling uh, throughout the world um, on the uh, very, the initiatives on his uh, client. And that's happening on a small scale uh, with like single prints. And it's also happening on a massive wide scale. Um, if we turn our attention to, for example, um, Van Der Zee's commission uh, photographs of uh, Marcus Garvey. Um, exactly. so Marcus Garvey was a, a major uh, Pan-African uh, leader um, in the 20s. He's from uh, Jamaica and um, had his headquarters um, of the UNIA um, in New York City. Um, for the summer of uh, 1924, um, uh, Garvey uh, turns to Van Der Zee um, and asks him to um, be his official photographer. Um, this is a important turning point um, in uh, Garvey's uh, movement um, because they are having, uh, the UNIA is having a, a an international uh, UNA conference that summer. Um, Van Der Zee is the, the photographer who captures um, the parade processions on the street of the UNIA. Um, he also captures a number of UNIA individuals um, that go into his studio and take family portraits or, or individual portraits. Um, once Van Der Zee, you know, um, follows the um, guidelines of his contract, takes all those photographs, um, then the photographs end up having these, these other lives, these sort of afterlives once they leave the studio. Um, and I, I became very... Like Marcus Garvey. As opposed to a private mm -hmm. individual. That's you right. Know, That's God right. needed to amplify his he, image in order completely. to be the leader that he was and that he aspired to. Mm. But you need evidence of that. You need yeah. photograph. That's right. So, and photography was to that. And disease to enact his right. agenda. That's right. That's right. And get that that evidence. And then that evidence was uh, reproduced and distributed literally around the world. Mm -hmm. um, through Marcus Garvey's newspaper, uh, the the Negro World, um, and it was in um, you know full play, uh, full page uh, displays um, of Van Der Zee's photographs showing um, you know the the various events and processions that are taking place. It was a a moment when um, black readers um, from literally all over the world, from South America, um, from Africa, really throughout the United States, um, were able to open up uh, the pages of this newspaper and, and experience uh, the parade uh, beyond a, a textual mm -hmm. uh, in description. They were actually, as you were, as you said, Daoud, um, they had, uh, you know, visual evidence um, that this was happening um, on the on the streets of, of Harlem. And, and Van Der Zee had a, uh, a central role of um, creating uh, those photographs in order to have that um, sort of uh, conversation, that visual conversation um, going on uh, throughout the African diaspora. Yeah, and, and you know, from the practical standpoint of uh, running a, port a neighborhood portrait studio in which the influx of clients was absolutely essential to the solvency of the business, which eventually with the introduction of the Kodak Brownie, and now you can make your own pictures, you press the button, we do the rest. And that was the beginning of the decline of the neighborhood uh, photo studio. But mm -hmm. the uh, Marcus Garvey Commission, that was a good commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was unusual uh, in, in, in terms of his uh, studio practice you know, to be commissioned to do both the formal portrait, to be able to photograph the parade. Uh, you know, it kind of went both ways, obviously, in terms of Garvey's own need for his own photographic representation, but mm -hmm. for the sake of, uh, you know, the solvency and the, you know, uh, the continuing of Van Der Zee's studio business. Mm 
that it mm -hmm. was in the business. Mm -hmm. No one funded it. He didn't get right. a grant. He, right. he was not the recipient of a Rosenwald Fellowship or no. any no. of the, He didn't get a Harmon Prize. You know, That's all right. of these, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. opportunities that were actually taking place around him. His work was outside of that was. That Yes, I think that is so important Important to, to reinforce that, that point, Dawood, that when we talk about the artist of the Harlem Renaissance era, uh, we're talking about a completely different avenue of, of patronage, right? When we talk about the, the fine artists, uh, um, the, the painters and, and the sculptures, um, we look to the, the Harman, Harman Foundation, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Rosenwald, um, the WPA, when you come a little bit later into um, the depression era, these institutions that really kind of stepped in and said, you know, we want to support um, Black artists with, um, with money and with exhibition um, opportunities and with networking um, opportunities. Um, there was a, it, it was a whole kind of uh, culture um, and uh, opportunity that created a, a um, a whole, a whole way of uh, being valued as an artist. And so that's going on over here. And Van Der Zee is not involved in that at all. Van Der Zee, at the end of the day, is he's a businessman. He's a, a businessman and he's running a business. He's running a storefront uh, studio. Um, and his um, primary focus is not to you know, impress the jurors at the Harmon Foundation or to write letters applying to grants. He is solely focused on um, bringing in business like yep. Marcus Garvey and individuals who are, are coming in um, and producing, uh, producing photographs. Um, and I think that's such an important point that sometimes gets forgotten about Van Der Zee. Some people really want to kind of kind of loop him into uh, the experience of a, a fine artist of the Harlem Renaissance era and the, and the kind of uh, the structures of, of making and support um, that advance their careers. Uh, Van Der Zee was uh, this was this was a, a business. And when you have a business. Um, you're going to have a, a very particular relationship uh, with your with your subjects and a, a need to to advertise and a need to keep uh, mm -hmm. the business uh, going. Um, one of the ways that he kept the business going um, in the, the 20s and, and 30s um, was he had a very intricate system for um, for finding uh, photographs of already, uh, you know, um, uh, taken subjects and so that he could return to those um, uh, mm -hmm. negatives. Um, and then oftentimes he would, for example, superimpose an older um, image of that same person um, with a, a younger um, image. I'm thinking about one um, example, um, an unfortunate example of a uh, young woman who uh, died be before her prime. Um, mm -hmm. But Van Der Zee was able to, um, in his mortuary photograph of her, um, include a, an image of, of her, not only you know, in her funerary kind of spread, um, but then to superimpose um, a portrait of her from, from younger years. Um, this is one of various um, ways that Van Der Zee not only, as he said, he said, I, I don't only take photographs, but I make photographs. Um, there was always a, a level of, you know, beyond, you know, the shutter, you know, closing and opening and there being lighting and being uh, behind the camera. Uh, Van Der Zee um, did a, a high level of work um, on, uh, on the negative and also um, on, the, on the surface um, of his photographs. Um, this took the form of him um, of hand painting, um, uh, enhancing, uh, you know, certain, um, you know, lines, taking out Brighten, lines, adding lines, that's right, by brightening teeth, um, adding um, eyelashes, um, you know, making sure, okay. you know, the hair okay. was in place. Curl out of the pipe. That's right, that's right, very playful things like smoke coming out of yeah. cigars, or you had like light emanating um, from, um, from candles. Well, um, all at the service of the client, liking the photograph, mm -hmm. maybe ordering a second or a third, mm -hmm. and definitely at some point coming back. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. That return. Yes. That return. Yeah. 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 Very uh, important. Yeah, it, it, it was a business. I mean, it was in the parameters of that business. He mm -hmm. tried to practice his craft uh, at the highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, the other, uh, when you started talking about the deceased young woman, it also made me think about his funeral pictures. Mm -hmm. He did uh, a book's worth, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately. Mm -hmm. I think it was called, what was it called? Something Harlem Book dead. of the Dead. Yeah. Book mm -hmm. of the Dead. Mm -hmm. All photographs of deceased people. So that was yeah. another uh, piece of his business. A uh, major I don't think uh, it's customary today, but when someone passes, to mm -hmm. photograph them at the funeral, if it's a young child, to hold them as if they're alive, to make one final photograph for memories. So, it was uh, as multifaceted as it needed to be. It was in order to so. Yes, that yeah. is that is correct. And not in addition to the mortuary photographs, he's also doing um, I, ID photographs. Um, he is doing. There's a whole. There are whole boxes and binders of photographs of pets, of dogs and cats that he did, um, <laughs> as as well. Um, he also did uh, photographs for. Um, we we know we don't have a lot of. We don't have any examples, but there is a written account of him doing photographs for legal claims um, as as well. Um, if you needed a photographer, uh, Van der Zee um, could um, do a, a range. He, he sort of wore all the hats, um, but predominantly he was a, a studio um, uh, portraitist. Um, but it's important to understand the different um, aspects of his, his practice. Um, one practice um, that really piqued my interest when I was doing research um, was the photographs that he was creating um, later in his career. Um, so we always talk about the Harlem Renaissance of the, the 20s and 30s, um, but I was so interested to see what he was doing in the 40s, the 50s, and, and the 60s, right before um, the Harlem on My Mind um, show. And during that time, um, scholars have written about um, the fact that Van der Zee uh, was involved in um, doing um, enhancement work on photographs. And so it would be um, in enlargement work, um, it would be uh, recopying work um, or um, really trying to um, uh, um, enhance photographs that people would bring uh, to him. The interesting thing about this aspect of his practice was that the photographs that people were bringing to him were not originally taken in his studio. Yeah. So these were photographs that people you know, took maybe down south like when they were whole, visiting. A whole other skill set. They were a whole, like, like, going, like going to a digital retoucher today before yes. there was such a thing. Yes, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So they would uh, they would bring these photographs to, um, to Van Der Zee and they would know to bring it to Van Der Zee because he had um, a whole range of advertisements um, in, in different newspapers. And they would, they would a, a lot of the times be um, captioned with bring old photos back to life. Um, and so people would bring him these photos and he would, uh, he would recopy them, he would enlarge them, um, and he would, he would enhance them, and then he would give them back uh, to the client. Um, this happened uh, locally, um, but most interestingly, this also happened um, beyond Harlem and internationally. Um, Van der Zee was um, using his advertisements to create a whole different um, range of, um, of clients from around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and scholars um, were able, who spoke to him and interviewed him around the Harlem on my mind uh, time, uh, we're really able to get a lot of details um, about what this what this work entailed. Uh, the fact that he was getting requests and letters for this service from clients in Russia, in South in South Africa, in South America, um, in uh, in the Caribbean. 
um, from really all over the world, people were emailing, um, not emailing, they were writing letters. <laughs> if only, if they only could email him. <laughs> they, were, they were writing letters uh, requesting for him. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Let me ask you. Not yet, not yet. Something, I know. You know yes. Because um, I, uh, for someone who's known Van Der Zee's work as long as I have, uh, I'm I'm really interested in knowing um, how your research uh, into Van Der Zee began, mm -hmm. and more significantly, how your uh, breaking the mold of the myth of the mythic or the Black essentialized notion of Van der Zee as a singular figure. Um, what was it that led you to go beyond what is most known about Van der Zee to do more than scratch the surface and place Van der Zee back in the circumstances uh, in which the work came from, as well as to bring a contemporary critical reading to mm -hmm. his practice, mm -hmm. which, uh, which I think is uh, really quite uh, meaningful would be the easiest way to say it, but mm -hmm. has for a long time been necessary. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what what led to your yeah. reason? What led to you taking yeah, the hard mode, not the easy mode? Thank you, that's a really great question. I think what started it was um, before I started um, no, actually, after I got my master's in art history, um, I decided um, to do a Fulbright in, in Montreal, um, and I spent a year um, in the William Notman um, archive at McCord Museum. Um, it's a museum of Canadian history um, and culture, um, and they have this collection of photographs uh, by a Scottish uh, Canadian photographer by the name of William Notman. William Notman had a, um, a, a pre eminent uh, studio um, in Canada in the 19th century. Um, I They had a literally, I, I think one of the, the largest and complete uh, collections of a studio photographer um, in, in Canada. And I spent a year looking at portraits after portraits after portraits, learning about his practice, learning about sort of the range of um, uh, of of his um, engagement with photography, um, the different audiences he was engaged with, and it was it was really through that um, that I became very interested in continuing with thinking about uh, studio photography in particular. Um, I had always had an interest in photography, but really wanted to narrow it down to the the practice of. Uh, the studio that we've talked, um, you know, so, so much about. Um, and so in, in thinking about the studio setting um, within an African American context, um, you know, Van Der Zee um, definitely came to mind. Um, and the transition from um, thinking about Notman to thinking about Van Der Zee um, happened um, very, um, uh, very kind of easily given sort of the similarities in, in their practice. Um, what was different, obviously, was the 19th century context um, to the early 20th century context, a, a context where um, within in terms of black life, there's so much um, dynamic change uh, that is happening. And I was interested in, in looking at that or starting to to rethink about the Harlem Renaissance era um, and um, how all of that change that was happening um, was really intersecting with Van Der Zee's uh, practice as a, as a studio um, photographer. And so I started there in Harlem, but once you start in Harlem, you have to go, you have to go beyond uh, the Harlem Renaissance with Van Der Zee's practice, um, because we know he had a decades long engagement with photography. And so it was really important for me um, just like my study with William Notman, to really understand the, the co more comprehensive um, picture. Um, I really wanted to do that with Van Der Zee as well. And so that more comprehensive picture, um, you know, took me out of the Harlem Renaissance into this um, period of the 40s and 50s and 60s, which is barely talked about, 
Um, and then really on to this, this moment in which we began with uh, the Harlem on my mind uh, moment. Um, I, I like to um, say, and I mentioned in the book that um, really looking at Van Der Zee's longer career, you can almost tell the, the history of photography um, through this one uh, photographer. Um, and I, I just um, really love thinking about um, not only the development of his practice, um, but how, um, just as, as we've talked about, his subjects um, are also having um, as much of an impact on him and his practice mm -hmm. um, throughout the decades of his, um, his engagement with photography. No, it's, uh, well, it's, it's really, I think, uh, the kind of uh, necessary research and contextualization uh, that hasn't happened that I think gives uh, this book uh, such value. So I, I just want to say, we talked before, but I just want to say how much I appreciate this book and no doubt how much other will appreciate uh, the depth of your scholarship uh, in making this book possible. Thank you. Thank you so for much. Not, that for, means... not, for not taking the easy path, yes. but doing the deep dive and the deep research. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means so much to me, Dawood, especially given how much I, I admire your, your work. Well, thank you. Thank um, you. I think uh, we're getting a message to uh, feel free to ask about uh, if anyone has any questions okay, uh, or, or we can. Uh, yeah, we can, we can continue. Ask, we, we can also continue talking. <laughs> okay, we, it's on. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. we, we have one question. So maybe if, if I read this one question, that will get other people to feel encouraged to bring questions of their own, which would be great. Uh, this is from Warren Critchlow. Uh, Professor Boone, around 1982, James Van Der Zee made a portrait of the artist Jean-Michel Basquiat a year before he died at age 96. Can mm -hmm. you contextualize, provide a backstory for that encounter between two Black artists of different generations? How did it come about? Did Basquiat initiate or commission that portrait sitting as it took place in Van Der Zee's studio? Or did Van Der Zee seek out Basquiat? I'm fascinated by that image, composition, and the aesthetic of the print as it speaks to the distinctive Van der Zee craft. I'm thinking of Basquiat's pose and the props that constitute the mise en scene of that particular image. Diego, Cort my friend Diego Cortez, this isn't in the question, mm -hmm. always claimed it was his jacket that was draped over oh, really? Basquiat that day. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, I'm thinking of Basquiat's pose and the props that constitute the mise en scene of that particular image. Is that now prominent image the only one taken or were there others made in the session? Why was this particular image selected and printed over say other possible takes? Mr. Bay's insight on this image would be valuable as well. Thanks so much for your insights. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Emily. Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. I'll I'll answer the the last portion of that question uh, first. So there were actually um, uh, various uh, uh, versions of the the photograph, um, and some of the photograph of Basquiat is sort of leaning forward um, with his. Um, you know, kind of uh, chin on his, um, leaning on his hand and others he's seated back. Um, in some of the photographs, you'll you'll notice a, a cat uh, within the frame and others, um, the cat does not exist. Um, these photographs were um, taken at the, as you, as you know, the very latter part of uh, Van Der Zee's practice. Um, this is so following 19, uh, the Harlem on my mind show in 1969. After that, uh, Van Der Zee became a quote unquote, like rediscovered famous uh, artist within the, the art world. Um, and that led to a number of different uh, commissions and, and opportunities. Um, starting in uh, the seventies, um, he, uh, you know, kind of went back into his uh, studio, took things out from uh, from storage um, and used um, much of the same furniture, uh, the same camera, uh, the same lighting uh, that he had used um, in his earlier decades and in the 20s or, or 30s. Um, his, um, his wife and um, partner at the time, um, uh, Donna, 
um, and a bunch of other friends of James Vanderzee um, had sent out sort of a, a call um, to allow people who wanted uh, commissioned uh, photographs uh, to take place. Most of the individuals that um, um, ended up having their photographs taken were well-known um, individuals in in the art in the arts and and cultural um, field. Uh, Ruby D. Ruby D. Williams. We had um, uh, Scott, Scott. We had Bill Cosby. Um, uh, that's that's right. We had um, uh, Regina Perry. I mean, the the list is the list is is long, um, and they all have this this same um, style that is evocative of his uh, work from the twenties and thirties. Um, with with Vanderzee and I mean with Basquiat in uh, particular, um, that sitting um, actually resulted in not only the the portraits being taken, Vanderzee's uh, photographs being taken, uh, but Basquiat also uh, made a a portrait of of Van. Um, so you can imagine um, that this was a, a real um, exchange and a conversation um, that happened um, as they were, you know, spending time together, um, this very kind of um, intentional and, and drawn out uh, process. So at, at the same time that Van Der Zee was capturing uh, Basquiat, ba Basquiat was also do, doing um, a similar thing for, for Van Der Zee. Yeah, uh, the, the painter, Ed Clark, took his daughter, Melanca, uh, oh. or sitting. And every time I went to Ed's studio, he couldn't resist pulling this beautiful mm. Vanity portrait of his daughter, Melanca, out to show me one more time. Oh, that's <laughs> so nice. I, I don't think I've seen that one. Oh, it's so nice to to know that there are photographs that haven't made it into the, um, you know, into books yet. That they are still um sort of out there being cherished okay. by, by families. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the very, the, it's, it's a very interesting uh, moment in his work. You know that late revival because mm -hmm. for all practical purposes. They look like, and they have the mannerisms and the look and the furniture and the backdrop of 1920 and 1930, mm -hmm. although they were made very much in the uh, contemporary uh, moment at that time. So mm -hmm. they're kind mm -hmm. of uh, conceptually liminal portraits, if we want to kind mm -hmm. of go there, because they're the past and the present simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're beautiful pictures, and the fact that he was able to come back and with uh, Tony Barboza uh, assisting him, That's that right. people had the opportunity, you know, one more time, one more chance to uh, have their portrait done. Uh, yeah. That's right. And this is the moment where, you know, to have your portrait done uh, by Van Der Zee is to have your portrait taken yeah. by a yeah. and you that, know, and famous. Yeah. And that's very, something very different from walking in uh, from right, from in Harlem in 1920 and 1930 and 40. You know, yes. then he was a neighborhood photographer. At that moment, he was the fully celebrated James Van. Fully, Vanderbilt. fully, fully uh, celebrated by, by everyone. The, same, the subjects are different and the photographs, uh, you know, now, all these years later, uh, with UB Blake no longer being here, with Benny Andrews no longer being mm -hmm. here. That's right. They're Benny. also a historical document. Romare Bearden, Romare Bearden was also. Bearden. Yeah. Yes. yeah, so a lot That's of right. those subjects that he photographed then, uh, Camille Billups, who helped orchestrate it, Camille's no longer here. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. So they take on yet another meaning mm -hmm. uh, in this particular moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's this that turned out to be a great question. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Um, Ama Birch asks how much Van der Zee charged per session, or was it per photograph or print? Mm -hmm. Which I'm sure the answer would be different, just as you were saying, depending on what year it was. But do you have some general thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I don't know if I can give you a, a set um, amount because they did change over the years. Um, we have found uh, like one or two advertisements uh, that that list it. Um, and so on 
the advertisement, and this would be an ad from, I think it would, came out in 1942. Um, it would list the, the, the dollar amount, um, and you'd see a, a, a change or a shift in the amounts um, depending on the size um, and also the, the treatment. For example, um, in this one ad, he was advertising um, like sepia printing, um, so printing on, on different uh, colored uh, uh, paper. Um, you can imagine that he was also um, probably charging a little bit more for, for hand coloring. Um, there were some photographs in which um, the most, um, the vast majority of the print is hand colored. Um, for others, he's just adding um, like little tiny enhancements um, here or there. Um, I, I did do some um, research because I was curious as to how his prices compared to some of his peers. Um, and um, at the Howard University um, uh, archive, I was able to find a, um, uh, a letter, and this is kind of uh, a letter that one of his peers, uh, James Lattimore Allen, um, had written uh, to Elaine Locke, uh, listing the prices of his uh, photographs. And those prices were very much in line with uh, Van Der Zee, um, given the, the advertisements. Um, so as the, the prices changed um, over the years, um, they still did stay competitive uh, with his uh, peer photographers. And I think that's an important uh, uh, point to remember um, because um, as Dao Boud and I have both um, really emphasized, Van Der Zee is running a, a business and to run a business, you're also in to a certain extent competition uh, with other studios um, in the area. Um, and so he, he had to uh, set his prices um, accordingly. So what would you be able to say, Emily, um, related directly to that uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how much economic privilege would one had to have had to go to a Van Der Zee theater? Yeah, that, yeah. Is that something for just the middle class or the upper middle? Mm -hmm. Who was able to afford to go to a Van Der Zee and have their portrait done in mm -hmm. the 90s? 20s and 30s. You get to the 30s, you're talking about the height of the depression. Depression, so, yes. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. who, who during the heyday was actually able to go? Who were those clients who were Yeah, that is such pictures? a that's such a great question. It's one that I um have pondered for years. I was as I was working on uh, this book. Um, there is is there is no definitive way for me to answer that. Um, most scholars um, do um, argue that Van Der Zee was really catering to the the middle class and the upper middle class. Um, um, you know, black subjects. But you know, in interviews, Van Der Zee said more than once that he is is really catering to um, everyone. Um, you know everyone who um, dresses up um, in their Sunday best, um, those from, um, you know, the working class, the middle class, and, and the upper class. Um, so I tend to think, um, especially since we know that photography is extremely performative, um, we also know that there is a practice in the 20s and 30s of, um, you know, uh, families having a seamstress, working as seamstress, um, this, this love and care that goes into making clothes, um, taking care of clothes and then passing on clothes secondhand. Um, you can't necessarily um, look at someone and see what they're wearing and off the bat completely place them um, within uh, a class category. Those things are um, shifting um, and they're also extremely performative. And so I would like to believe that, um, you know, even there was a cost, obviously, to Van Der Zee's photographs, but I would like to believe that they were a whole lot more accessible to a whole lot more um, individuals across different, different classes um, in, in Harlem. And I, I think, I think we have to remember the, um, the, like the the specialness of what it meant to take a, a photograph, um, that to take a photograph would have been something that even if you didn't have a lot of means, you would you would save up for, you would put money um, aside for. And going to Van Der Zee's studio didn't have to be like, you know, photographs are today, this thing where you're doing it 
you know, every week or every day, or, you know, it's, it, it didn't have to, it was a special occasion. And for, for special occasions that mattered, um, I, I would believe that people of all class level um, would make that happen. And, and in, in interviews, Van Der Zee has described that to be so. Yeah. And it would have been a very common studio practice at that time too, to keep sets of clothing in the studio uh, in case the subject needed to be dressed up a little more. You know, there were outfits there that they could wear. I mean, it, it, it would not have been usual. And it doesn't suggest uh, in any way that most people who came to the studio needed that. But on occasion, it would not have been uncommon uh, to make use of, you know, clothing that was uh, kept at the studio. But mm -hmm. I, I often wondered about that myself, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I so wonder if, about it too. You know, you... Middle, it would be something yeah. that you could just decide to do. And even then you wouldn't do it every month. You probably, you right. might do that once a year, maybe, or right. once a special occasion. And others, of course, would have to uh, save up. But mm -hmm. that's also mm -hmm. an indication of the degree to which people wanted to have that kind of self-representation, how important that was to them. Right, exactly. Go, okay, you won't get this this week. We'll put that in the picture jar. And we'll right. just save up until we have enough to go to Mr. Van Der Zee. You right, know. and it, it kind of speaks to the diversity of people within Harlem. And if, if we return the conversation back to the UNIA, um, we know that Marcus Garvey and the UNIA, um, a, a vast majority of his, of his followers were more uh, working class um, yeah. than the upper class, you know, and the, the middle upper class. Um, so the fact that he um, was able to, um, you know, reach that audience is um, is proof and indication that he he was really he was he was really capturing everyone and anyone in in Harlem. That's really what I would um, I would like to uh, believe when it comes along these these class lines. Um, also, the thing about um, uh, dressing up in and having clothes, uh, even though possibly other uh, studios did that. Um, Van Der Zee, Van Der Zee actually did, did not, he did not have outfits um, on, on hand. Um, I often wondered it because I, I, I mentioned it and his wife said exactly the same thing. Yes. Well, and I'm, I'm also just echoing um, uh, what Donna um, has described oh, okay. to me. And she is um, very, you know, obviously intimately aware of what was um, in the studio and what was, what was not. Um, so even though that was a practice, it wasn't something that that Van Der Zee um, um, engaged in. But again, that's sort of an indication of you know what people are are bringing uh, to the to the studio for these really special um, occasions of representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've just put a comment that was more of a comment than a question uh, from Brett Kaplan into the chat, which has a portrait of the Black Jews of Harlem from uh, 29, I think, mm -hmm. in, in this uh, article. But that made me think also in terms of studio practice, whether you want to say anything comparative, because you think about Sita Bay or Keita or um, the Liverpool studios that Tina Camp wrote about, yeah. and what you think might, that might be as a kind of uh, transnational phenomenon or even comparative in the U.S. if you've thought about studios in L.A. or Chicago? Oh, that's such a good, that's such a good question. Okay, let me, let me think about it. Hmm. I'm trying to think what, what city to even, to even compare it to. You know, I, I think um, Van Der Zee and Harlem, um, I think part of me wants to say, and in certain places within the United States, there were um, uh, different communities of uh, studio photographers, um, probably not to the um, extent and number uh, that was in Harlem. I think that's really what makes Harlem and, and Van Der Zee um, exceptional, um, that we had a, a world of uh, 
uh, black photographs that wasn't just in uh, like print media. It wasn't just the Prices magazine. It wasn't just the local newspapers and the society papers, um, but you actually had an, an active uh, photography studio scene. Um, you know, a, a culture that can be found in, in little pockets everywhere, but nothing um, like the extent of, um, of what we see in Harlem. Um, and that sort of extensive kind of network um, had to have an, an impact on, uh, on uh, sort of the, the sense of uh, uh, visual literacy um, and sort of visual uh, sophistication. Uh, that people had when they walked into the studio knowing exactly what they wanted because they had seen you know this cousin's photograph or they they knew from the window displayed that they could articulate exactly the size or the pose that that they were in um it, it made um i think viewers um hyper aware of their likes and dislikes um to to an extent I'm not quite sure you you saw um, elsewhere outside of you know newspapers and, and print media. And that's what that's what one of the things that made Fandersy's uh, studio and, and Harlem uh, so distinct. Yeah, I think Vanderzy um, had the uh, exceeding good fortune to be not only in New York when he was, but in Harlem. You know, because anywhere else uh, other than Harlem at that particular moment, with Harlem being the socio-cultural locus pretty much of uh, Black America uh, in, in that time, with you know, the significant, uh, the significant cultural and social activity, social on the side of the Garveyites and culture on, on the side of all the musicians and writers who were congregating in Harlem and in conversation. And Van de Zee pretty much found himself right in the middle of that, at the height of that activity. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 was, uh, it, it was extremely good planning or uh, yeah. extremely good luck on his part to it end was. up where he did when he did. It, it did. And I, I wonder, I mean, if you also just thinking about this time period, Harlem had such a cultural cachet um, beyond Harlem. Um, Harlem was known as the Black Mecca. Um, yeah. And having that affiliation um, must have, um, you know, aided Van Der Zee in reaching this um, audience beyond Harlem. Um, I often ask myself, um, why would these people from, you know, uh, from South America and, and Russia and all over the world, why have your photograph recopied and enlarged by sending it all the way to Harlem, as opposed to just using a local uh, uh, studio photographer in your country? And I think part of it was that that appeal, that that magic um, in that Harlem had this this sort of uh, magnetism, um, and and Van Der Zee is completely leveraging um, that that narrative to um, uh, to increase his his you know his clientele across the world. Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly, because that was a long way to go. It was but a very it was long, gone, but yeah, it was Harlem, USA. That's right. That's if you right. never visited there, you heard that that place was jumping. That That's was right. Place, that was the place to be. That's you right. Tell you to be there, stomping <laughs> it over, you know, even you know, as it uh, as it has for a very long time, you know, black culture has insinuated itself into world culture. And mm -hmm. Harlem at that moment was pretty much uh, doing that same thing. You mm -hmm. know, black culture in Harlem was reverberating globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, here it is already eight o'clock. And uh, before we started, Dawood was like, this might just be part one of like what could be a two or three part <laughs> series. And I see that's actually the case. But I just want to thank you both. This was really, really wonderful. Um, anybody uh, who hasn't already been convinced to pick up this book should really do so. It's really fabulous. And 
Um, pick up my book. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> everyone pick up your book. <laughs> everyone pick up their books. <laughs> and um, thank you. And uh, hope everyone feels inspired, and we can all go on and and think more about this photography and this kind of form of black self representation. It's really uh, a um, a gift back, I think, with what you've done, Emily. So, and uh, thanks to you both. So, good night, and um, hope to see everyone again at Intellectual Public soon. Take care. Okay, Bye. and uh, thank you for extending the invitation, Ken and Emily. Again, thank you for uh, this important groundbreaking work that you've done. And for those of you who are still listening in, get this book. <laughs> it's an important book. Oh, thank you both so much. Have a good okay. night, everyone. Good night, everybody.